Hello and welcome to It's Going to Be All Right. My name is Niklas Mitrovic and I am the coordinator of the Writing Center at NMBU. And I'm Clayton Gwen. I am a senior writing advisor and PhD student at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. So I guess we probably yeah. need to give an apology to anyone who is expecting to also hear Nicholas on last week's episode. The thing is that we had, uh, we recorded a podcast and uh, I would say uh, an epic conversation. It was really good. It was really good. It was the last day before Easter. And I know that you were drinking beer and I was drinking wine and it was just... Um, it was something else. They were just enjoying themselves <laughs> and you know, getting, yeah. getting deep into writing and revision and the revision roadmap and all of these really good techniques. And then lo and behold, my computer deleted my audio files, my audio directory, and I lost everything on my side. And so we, so yeah, we had to make a last minute decision to give you what you got last week, which was just me, unfortunately. But it was still useful, like a walkthrough of the revision roadmap. But the thing is that we still hope that, that the, the podcast, the last podcast, will resurface um, magically, just reappear on your computer, or you just find the file mm -hmm. or something, and then it will be like the, it will be an Easter egg. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, that's <laughs> absolutely perfect. The lost Easter egg episode from Easter. <laughs> Perfect. I mean, some we have to look at it like this. Uh, maybe we were fortunate that we got this opportunity to have this, um, the last episode, yeah. you know? Uh, That's very not, mystical. And, that could and, be something that many podcasters never get the opportunity to do. But, uh, what, yeah, because everything is smooth. Yes. And they're, uh, <laughs> they're in the same place, and they have redundancy programs recording, and here we are trying to figure all of this out for ourselves. Uh, but we thought it would be a good idea for this episode to kind of go back and try to touch upon some of the more practical points of how do you ask for feedback and how can you engage and interact with feedback through your writing process, how to sort of hmm. identify um, particular idiosyncratic uh, writing problems that you as an individual might encounter and ways that you can just improve your writing process through practice. So whereas that's really what we talked about in the Lost episode and the, the episode that I had released for last week on the revision roadmap was almost more of like a technical document of how you can conceptualize your writing process and to get uh, specific types of feedback focuses and uh, specific ways of breaking your writing down across five drafts. But it didn't really dive into uh, how do you operationalize it? How do you hmm. use it? Uh, what would it really look like? So that's what we're going to try and get into uh, for this episode instead. And I think that, um, I mean, the, the revision roadmap, it has five stages, which is, I mean, it could be more, but in this version, it has five stages. And we could kind of just talk a little bit around uh, who you should talk to during the different writing stages. Mm -hmm. And, and, also digital resources that could be useful. Exactly. So we will actually go in and, and kind of give you more hands-on use. And a little bit later in the episode, we'll talk about some of the really great free digital resources that are available to anybody, not just students at NMBU. But we should probably mm. just begin then with why is feedback so important? And we're probably biased being writing advisors. We can, well, and that's why we have a <laughs> podcast to tell you why these sorts of things are, are important for you. I think it, uh, I don't know if this is a, like an English saying, but it's definitely a saying in Norwegian. And that is that two brains think better than one. Mm -hmm. Is that like a saying in English I, or is it just in Norwegian? I wouldn't say that it's necessarily a, a phrase, but I've definitely heard that. Uh, no, no, you're right. Um, we'd say two heads are better than one. So that's kind of the essence of getting feedback, right? Mm -hmm. And that there's something about just telling someone about your ideas, your thoughts, and they can hopefully help you refine them. Maybe they can contribute mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's very important that because writing can kind of seem like a very individual thing to do, and it is in a lot of ways because it's your thoughts and your voice and your style and your research very often um, coming out, 
Uh, and it, writing ends up being mostly done in isolation. So it's really important that you are finding people who are actually quite constructive in giving you feedback, feedback that works, um, that they are attempting to understand what it is that you're trying to say because I guess maybe one of the main problems is people will kind of they can go and just rely on feedback from maybe a, a supervisor who hasn't really thoroughly read uh, the whole document uh, or maybe doesn't really understand exactly what it is that you're trying to do uh, mm. and they're, they're maybe looking more at very minute aspects of the writing like your format your um, your grammar and your punctuation, those sorts of things that are, you know, like the further areas of revision that you should work on based on the revision roadmap. So for me, feedback is really important because as you say, with two heads being better than one, people can kind of spot other problems that you might not be seeing in things like the clarity or the logical construction of your writing. But it's just important that you are getting kind of the feedback that you need based on where you are in the writing process and that the people you're getting feedback from are there to help you get the type of feedback you're looking for and are not ignoring the type of feedback that you need to support your writing and saying things that are kind of more or less irrelevant to what you really need right now to improve your writing where it is. And I also think that there's different um, types of feedback. So um, let's say that you ask someone to give you feedback on something that you have written, then that's one type of feedback. Another type of feedback is telling someone about your project. And then they will, trying to understand what you're saying, paraphrase you. Mm -hmm. And that could be a uh, feedback. Like sometimes it's very clear that they don't really understand what you're trying to tell them. And that's a type of feedback. Then your explanation isn't good mm -hmm. enough. You might use too difficult words. Uh, maybe it's not you know, logical. There, there, there's many things that could be problematic that you should uh, work on. There may be a lot of tacit or um, implicit knowledge behind what you're trying to explain. A lot of connections that you are well aware of because you've been the one doing the research that mm -hmm. the person you're talking to is not aware of because they're not doing the research. They are maybe not within your field of research. And I think that that's a really good point that you bring up that Feedback doesn't, writing feedback doesn't need to be on your writing. Asking, no, no, no. asking for that oral auditory feedback and just talking to people about what it is that you're writing and trying to explain it um, orally is, that's absolutely right. That is a, a different type of feedback that maybe makes it easier for you to step away from the technical aspects of your writing and think more about the construction of your ideas behind the writing. And at least to me, uh, writing is talking to a lot of different people and trying to explain what I'm working on. Um, and sometimes the way that I decide to say something will end up um, in the, the, the final product. Mm -hmm. So maybe we could like start out with... Um, the first first stage of the revision roadmap. I mean, we've been talking about how to make an outline before, but we could kind of just talk a little bit about who should you get feedback from um, at this stage. Mm -hmm. So I think at the outline stages, you're getting ready to write a first draft. And, and one thing you need to keep in mind in how you can understand the revision roadmap is basically that there's not a clear divide between each draft that as you work on an aspect of one section, um, you, you can actually be working on other sections as well. There is uh, quite a bit of overlap. So for example, when you're building an outline, you're really working on your structure, your flow, and your cohesion, uh, but it's mm -hmm. maybe not the focus of revision at that point. So when you're working on your outline, when you're working through your first draft and maybe encountering some obstacles or finding your ideas weren't really well structured, as well structured as you thought. Getting feedback from from your friends, your colleagues uh, could be quite good. Obviously, I think it's a good idea to sit down and talk about your outline with your supervisor uh, because you should be pointing out things like, okay, well, who is the intended audience? Uh, who is it that I'm really writing for? Is the purpose of this very clear and 
expressed quite nicely in one or two sentences as part of my outlines introduction section. Uh, are all the parts sort of constructed in a way that's going to help support that argument? Um, and getting your feedback there uh, is at the outline stage, I think would maybe be a little bit more beneficial for some people. And that way they can sit down and feel very confident in writing the first draft. And I'm always cautious, and this is just my personal style too, I don't really share the first draft with anybody until it's done. But I share my outlines and I share a lot of my ideas that are going into the first draft with people. But I want to make sure I have a full written document that I feel is complete enough before I share it to get more focused feedback on the presentation of the writing. I think that uh, what I like to do is that I don't share my first draft because I don't really, it doesn't seem necessary to me uh, because it's just, you know, so wordy. It's not really written for anyone else than myself. Um, but I share the outline, like the blueprint. And the reason for that is that this is kind of how I have decided to connect all my different arguments to present something. You know, to, to um, it's kind of like a way of um, you really want your arguments to, to flow, to, to make sense, to be good. Uh, and so I think it's really beneficial to talk to your supervisor at this point. You have an out outline, you have a, a blueprint, like, does this look like a good idea? Do you think this project will, um, do you think this can happen? Mm-hmm. And also with other students or your colleagues. Yeah, depending on where you are within your, your level of research. Uh, and that's something I utilize quite a lot is, uh, like, I'm very fortunate um, working at the Writing Center. Uh, even though it's only one day a week, I still get the opportunity to come in and speak with people who are more or less experts in improving writing. And it's good for me to come in and talk through some of my ideas. Uh, I'm also very fortunate that in my department, a colleague of mine was a former writing advisor as well, and her and mm -hmm. I are quite mm -hmm. good friends. So we actually sit and discuss a lot of the conceptual formation of things that form our outlines. Um, you know, the theoretical frameworks, the conceptual frameworks, the the problem statement or problem stealing, um, mm -hmm. the purpose, who we think this information is really useful for, uh, what the core of what it is that our research is trying to accomplish. And that is quite nice because, especially because she is studying something completely different from me and that non-expert feedback to help me realize, okay, you know, if my intended audience is a bit more general and I'm really directing a very specialized topic towards non-specialists, I need to make sure that my language and my ideas and, and my connections between all of those points are very clear and sort of walk people through the process step by step. I really can't assume that my intended audience is going to know as much as I know about this. Uh, and that is mm -hmm. one of like the big struggles, of course, is getting all of those ideas fit into a logical, clear outline that you can work from. And I, this is just like from my own um, experience I, I think that talking with experts at this point is, has been to me really beneficial um, and it has something to do with just um, getting kind of like their approval that you know this project looks like a good idea everything is logically connected and it's not before you really start kind of turning that information into paragraphs that it is important to talk to people that is outside your field or preferably outside of academia to see if they can actually understand what you're trying to communicate. But at like the outlining stage, I really like to talk with the experts to see if, if, uh, if this can fly in, in, a, in a way. That's a really good point. Any good digital tools that you like to use in the outlining process? Um, I would say that mostly what I end up doing is I just kind of rely on a lot of the articles that I have been reading um, and maybe try to follow up on opinion pieces um, or editorials mm. that might appear in some of the journals that I'm looking at. Um, and also because of the field that I'm studying in, which is sort of a, an interdisciplinary integration of natural sciences um, with an ecological focus and social and policy sciences with a focus on management and environmental law. Um, 
I actually quite find uh, technical documents uh, and like best practice documents quite good to go and look at and just sort of read mm. the abstracts mm. and just think to myself, do I feel like I am in a spot where I could construct an abstract like that? Um, and so this is something that it can be quite good for some people. We I, That one is... I, I had worked before with our... That, that's a useful tip, I yeah. think. Yeah, so I'd worked before with the veterinary school department of our university, and I said that they were looking as part of a workshop to have some activities that they could do to sort of improve um, the distillation of ideas, really getting people to think about what is the core of what my research article is supposed to be. And I presented them with the idea that you should try to make an elevator pitch, and you can think you have 30 seconds the length of time that you're in an elevator with someone before they get off at their level. Can you tell them the most important things about your research in that 30 seconds? And then you can go mm. to a longer type of pitch. Say, okay, now you have the, um, the lobby pitch. This person is sitting here waiting for a, a meeting. You maybe have one or two minutes. Describe your research and its intention to them in one to two minutes. And then you have your much larger business meeting pitch, which can you do the same thing in five minutes? And of course, the longer you, the longer amount of time you have, that's just like the word count limit that you have. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. more words you more have, detail. the more detail yeah. you can provide. It's much harder to get everything down to that 30 seconds down into 200 to 300 words. So I would say that not necessarily getting other feedback in, in written format or the what I'd already talked about with people just talking to me and me talking to them about my research, but really just looking at some of the articles that I've liked and trying to see how have they structured an abstract and am I able to write sort of a, a summary for myself that, that can be a really good starting point. Uh, when I feel like I can write that abstract, I feel like I can write the outline because now I have the word count to spread it across several paragraphs or several pages and then start adding the details. I, th I think what I like to do, I wouldn't really call it, a, it is a digital tool, but we're so used to using it that it doesn't really count and it's called uh, Microsoft Word. Mm. <laughs> and <laughs> Absolutely. And I like to, absolutely. And I like to create lists. So, I mean, if I'm, if I'm diving into the literature and um, as we talked about before on a previous podcast, it's all about trying to organize your note taking and categorizing uh, what you read and the notes you take under, you know, themes or categories. So it's easy to, to use them and turn them into um, different paragraphs within your text. Mm -hmm. um, and at this stage, I also, as I told you, I like to create lists. Um, also been trying these mind mapping uh, softwares. Like there, there is a bunch of free kind of mind mind mm -hmm. mapping apps that you can get on your iPhone, and I found them to be quite useful and and interesting. And some of them can be quite complex, but I've just been using like the basic functions. Um, but I, I think I like that, and I, I also think that many people find um, mind mapping a, a really good way of kind of you know. The, Organizing your thoughts, I think, mm -hmm. and it could be a, a really good way of creating this um, this outline, this blueprint, and, and also organizing your notes at the same time. Yeah, and and all of that to have a visual that you could show someone is a great way to get some feedback and see do all of these visual connections I'm trying to make make sense to you, you know, my supervisor, mm -hmm. my colleague, my friend. Uh, an immediate family member or a spousal partner. Um, so and is it correct? That's another yeah. thing, you know? Uh, is you it? could talk to your supervisor, like, is this, or have I misunderstood something? And I, I also think that if you create a mind map, you could kind of start making connections. And then sometimes, like, you haven't really been reading about something that has been stating that specific connection. And mm -hmm. that's when you could start asking critical questions to the literature that you're using. So then you're kind of in a conversation with what you read because you're going to use some of it anyways. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's another um, conversational partner. I wouldn't say that you get feedback from the lit literature, but you can kind of give yourself feedback when um, 
comparing your ideas or your thoughts to what the author has said about a specific topic. Yeah, and that just sort of becomes self-reflection or uh, metacognition, I suppose you could call it, where you start thinking about your own process of thinking about what you have been reading in, and in writing. Your and, journey. <laughs> and so I, I guess one thing that we could also consider here is since we've been talking a lot about outlining in the pre-writing and maybe first drafting, um, we should also realize that as you move through these very distinct stages of focused revision and focused feedback, we're probably going to expect the type of feedback to change as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, let's go on and talk about how, how we would go about getting feedback on uh, improvement from a first draft to a second draft. We've been dealing with the big ideas, forming the necessary connections, trying to put it into a logical structure, um, you know, following our outline and making any adjustments as needed while we're writing. But so now we want to check, is this first document good enough? Um, and what can I do to strengthen it if it's missing things? And so this is where I said in the last week's so episode, expect to add, add more instead of remove content. But uh, stage two, writing from introduction to conclusion, I think at this point, uh, I've always found it beneficial to just talk to anyone. Uh, so I might not want to get feedback from my supervisor at this point, because, you know, this is kind of like the first draft and it's, uh, there's so many, it's all about just creating a product. And this is something that I'm not sure if you talked about this on podcast number two or if it's in the last podcast, but this is, um, I used to work, at, work as an artist for a couple of years. And then people think about artists as they're super inspired to create. And yeah, sometimes that's the case. And sometimes that's not the case. I mean, I had to get up in the morning, go over to the studio and just start drawing. And with no inspiration, you just have to get your hand moving. And it's the same thing with writing. And sometimes it's the same thing with thinking or refining your thoughts. You just have to start explaining it to people and then you get the practice. It's all about refining these thoughts. And that's when you kind of create a product that you can manipulate. So you just write from start to finish, get going. And to me, it always takes me about like a page maybe of writing before I starting to feel warm. Mm -hmm. And that's when, you know, the, the flow kind of starts. But it's around one page. The first page is difficult and it's super wordy and strange, but I'm just kind of ignoring that. And I know that I will hit that sweet spot in a little bit if I just keep going. Mm -hmm. So this is maybe not something specific to revision, but a type of feedback that you can give yourself in the process of writing your first draft, it's very unlikely that your research article or your essay is going to be completed the same day that you sit down to start writing it. Um, now, I'm not, Definitely I'm, not, not. Saying <laughs> that, uh, I'm not saying that a first draft cannot be done if it's very well planned out and you have eight consistent hours to work on it, but it's very likely... Some people can yeah, do it. Yeah, some people definitely But can. I cannot um, do it. It yeah. usually takes me a day or two or three to really feel like, okay, now the first draft is done. Um, I, so it's always a good thing to give yourself a little bit of feedback whenever you stop writing. I think that this is really important and we're very fortunate because we're working on programs like Microsoft Word. You can add comments or very often what I will do is I'll put a big highlight on the section and leave a note. This was my current thought. Oh, yeah when I stopped writing. This is where I thought the writing was going to go. This is a quick idea of what I thought I might be able to say next. And the point is you sort of leave yourself a little roadmap because let's be honest, interruptions and distractions happen all the time. We, we live in a social media world. Everybody's got cell phones and computers, um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, just a general phone call or text message can be enough to interrupt your stream of thought. And if you've been sitting working for a long mm. enough time period, uh, it's easy to allow yourself to become more distracted. Or maybe, you know, you're just, it's time for a coffee break or you need to use the toilet. And it's so easy for us to get up during the writing process and just think, oh, I know where I was at and I'll be able to come back and sit down like nothing happened and I didn't stop. And that's probably not likely. <laughs> 
what I really like about, as you said, because I do the same thing, I write something and then I add a little note. And sometimes that note is, you know, th there's something about writing something and it gets very wordy and, and not really, you know, it's, it's not explained particularly good. And, and then you write a little note, I tried to say, say this, and then you kind of write it again, and then you end up using the way you wrote it in the note in the main text. Mm -hmm. And this can because it's just a process of revising. Totally. And this is a really good practice that you can get into if you feel like you have a section, be it a paragraph, an entire subheading section. Um, maybe you're not satisfied with your introduction. Uh, leave a little editor's note for yourself. Um, what was it that you struggled with? Something that might that might be the first thing you want to come back and try to revise and work on in a new mm. draft. And this is really good for that sort of metacognition and reflection. Thinking about the things that you struggle with through the first draft helps you to clarify the ideas of things that you can immediately start working on when you're ready to begin revising and writing a second draft. And so again, this is where mm -hmm, the, the mm -hmm. revision roadmap, it, it shows these sort of clear, distinct stages that you should move through, but they're really not. They, they blend together and it's, it's more shades of gray than black and white because these little notes oh, yeah, that yeah. you leave for yourself through your first draft writing process are already starting to hint towards things such as ways you can improve structure and flow and cohesion or um, something you'd think didn't quite come out as clearly as you thought. Uh, it will change the outline, basically change the mm -hmm. blueprint because certain things didn't work or you just came up with something more interesting. And, and that's also why I say that at, at this stage in the writing process, I would just talk to anyone who's interested and then you can get that kind of indirect feedback. Uh, talk to the experts, but also talk to your grandmother that uh, in this case doesn't know anything about whatever you're writing mm -hmm. about because then it's all about being able to explain what you're working on um, in uh, the most understandable manner possible. Mm -hmm without losing import without simplifying so i think to me and then you will get this indirect feedback because they will try to just answer you in a way oh so you're saying that and sometimes they're spot on and sometimes they might even be you know they they contribute mm -hmm. they use a word that you're like okay that's that's the perfect word it's a much easier way of explaining what i'm trying to 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 write mm -hmm. and sometimes uh, they don't understand anything, and then you really need to. You yeah, know, you you, need you to, might need to look to elsewhere, work on that or one. <laughs> or that's another reason why the revision roadmap was made that you can really focus a bit more. What is it that I think I'm struggling with? Is it more of a conceptual problem? Is it more of a structural problem in the construction of my ideas? Is it a lack of clarity in the way I write my ideas? Mm -hmm. So it becomes easier for you to because ask that, for... That, that gets pretty yeah, clear. Yeah, it becomes easier for you to ask for the type of feedback from your supervisor and get them to focus on something that is more immediately useful to help you revise and make rapid and, and marked improvements. And that's really because, again, it, and I think most of us have experienced this. You submit something, it's a very early draft, maybe first or second, and you're still getting you know, comments on spell checking and proofreading and formatting and don't use this type of font. Uh, or you're getting the comments of like a whole page or a whole paragraph and it just says clarify. And they're like, what does any of that mean? You know? So it's, it's very useful it, for it, you. It's very unspecific. Yeah, exactly. It's very unuseful. And, and I've gotten that one a couple of times, exactly. you know, and uh, what you kind of end up doing is that you just rewrite the whole thing and you, you over explain and you just hope that, okay, this one hits home, this mm -hmm. one, <laughs> this is better. <laughs> and I mean, you probably just end up doing a lot more than you kind of needed to. You change stuff that, you know, maybe it was good, maybe it wasn't good, mm -hmm. who knows? Um, so more focused feedback would be good. And I, I think that just going back to having a conversation with your grandmother or anyone else who doesn't know anything about what you're writing about, um, sometimes you might discover that you struggle with explaining something. And it could be because it's, uh, it's difficult for you to explain it without using uh, a lot of the technical terms, or it might be difficult to explain it because you don't really 
you don't know enough mm -hmm. about it. You need to go back to the reading stage. You need to go dive into the literature, um, take more notes. You just basically need to go back to that stage and that might also change your outlook. Exactly. And sometimes if you find that there is an issue in sort of how clear an idea is coming across or how unclear an idea is coming across to somebody who's providing you some kind of feedback, you got to ask yourself, is it a question of how I formulated the sentence or the paragraph as an aspect of what you could consider uh, technical writing of improving clarity? Uh, or is it really more of like a, a structural issue and a cohesion issue of how you're sort of presenting the idea. And this is where I think if we start looking at major improvements you can be doing in a second draft, really focusing on this idea of the SEEC structure of constructing paragraphs is quite useful because maybe something is just unclear because it's being presented in an uncohesive way that there's too many disjointed ideas presented all side by side with each other, that it's difficult for the reader to pick them apart and figure out what the connection is. And part of the SEEC structure, which uh, basically stands for state, that should be your first topic sentence. The body of the mm -hmm. paragraph should then explain, uh, give evidence, give examples, and then you conclude and transition to the next paragraph. And I think that it's it's that explanation, but also the examples that you can give. Uh, explaining and giving evidence, you know, that just helps to kind of create almost like a definition of something, but it doesn't really help to be a good example. And so sometimes you might want to just think maybe the reason why someone isn't really clearly understanding what I'm trying to say is sort of the cohesion of how I'm explaining it. Can I give an example that is not an instance of the thing I'm trying to explain. Could I say it in a different way? You, could I use a metaphor, mm -hmm. could a simile? You, like skateboarding or climbing or anything, music. Exactly. Like we make these metaphors all the time. And I, I also think that um, just, you know, a, a little story. Um, I remember, I, I think I was a bachelor student at that point. Yeah, I was a bachelor student and I was writing this term paper about this Danish island called Selö, which means salt island. And they extract salt out of the sea with, uh, they dig these small kind of holes in, in, the, in the ground in the beach and then the seawater gets into these holes and then the sun uh, evaporates the water and then it's salt that is uh, left down in these small holes. And then they kind of cook it and they do a lot of stuff with it. but. The point is that I was trying to apply some kind of theory to this uh, ecological crisis that ended up happening because they um, cut down the whole forest mm. to <laughs> to fire these uh, ovens to uh, to kind of uh, distill the salt even even further. The point is that I tried to apply some kind of like a theoretical framework that it didn't make any sense. I just found it fascinating, and I also found the island fascinating, and I tried to combine two things that wouldn't really mm -hmm. fit and I didn't talk to anyone about this that was the main problem I just wrote this term paper on my own um, if I had talked to someone within the field like one of the experts at an early stage like at the outlining stage this might never you know uh, choose something yeah, else they, they might have said <laughs> yes yeah, it's, it's very apparent for me to see that the case is not a good example of the theory yeah. Exactly. You should choose something else. Or at the, the second stage, writing from introduction to conclusion, if I talk to someone in this, at this point, um, then it might be like, but, but how does this fit? How does this make mm -hmm. any sense? Um, and the same thing with the third stage, when it's all about the structure, the flow, the as you said, the, the, the SEEC structure. Um, because you, you kind of just want to deal with one idea in each paragraph and then you want to connect these different paragraphs to each other to make a logical mm -hmm. flow and it would be pretty apparent at some point that this doesn't work yeah. you know 
<laughs> and that's a very... But of course, I didn't apply any oh, of these no, tricks. No, of course not. You, so. you do what most people do. You write in isolation. You think that your thoughts and ideas are clear because you have all of this tacit background knowledge that you aren't communicating clearly to your reader. Or maybe just because you were trying to link things that were just too dissimilar from each other. And I think that this is a really good practice as well to become aware of being able at this stage of revision, not just to go and seek that feedback that is looking, uh, you know, are my ideas logical? Are, is my argument apparent? Um, does the evidence I provide support the thesis statement or the hypothesis that I am testing? But also think to yourself, am I presenting the ideas with good examples? And am I presenting things mm. in an order that makes sense? And are there any gaps that are missing between what I'm saying and what I really know and understand and would like to say? So that's why I always think that at this stage in revision, as you're working on a second draft, you should expect to probably add more because you realize there might be gaps that need to be filled in. You might need to reorder or split apart some of your paragraphs and rearrange them and move things to different sections. And then... And, and this is where creating the, the reverse outline could be yes. extremely useful to to, uh, to kind of to make that as apparent as possible. Like, okay, here I, I need to add something. I need to add another paragraph. I need more examples. These two ideas doesn't fit together. Um, I think we talked about how to create a reverse yeah. outline before, but you could a, explain it a again. A quick summary is um, if you understand the SEEC structure, you should have a topic sentence and a concluding sentence for every paragraph. All you're going to do is read the first and last sentence of every paragraph in your first draft, and you're going to reduce it, shorten it down to the core essence of that sentence. So you'll end up with each paragraph becomes two sentences and you basically rewrite your whole essay or article just in these two sentence blocks. But what it allows you to do is see what is the topic that I am dealing with in this particular section? Is it repeating itself somewhere else? Um, and what is the hmm. connection that I'm making as I end this paragraph and move towards the new topic, the new idea I'm presenting in the next paragraph? Does that conclusion fit and tie in or connect or expand and move towards the new idea? And if it doesn't, you probably need to do some revision in your concluding or topic sentences to make things fit. But more likely than not, you're, you're going to find that things are maybe not as well ordered and structured as you thought. But now you've got this quick little way of mm -hmm. re you know, reordering everything because you're just dealing with two sentences. And you can also see, oh, you know, maybe this is an illogical gap. I, I'm jumping from one idea to another. And there's actually some information that's missing between these two paragraphs. So I might need to write a new paragraph to kind of expand and create a better logical flow and transition of ideas when students come into the writing center um if we end up talking about seek structure how to how to write a paragraph uh what most people find challenging is the transition mm -hmm. like after the conclusion how to how to connect that paragraph to the next one how to connect one idea to the next idea and i think creating a reverse outline really makes it it makes it easier to to find these uh, transitions, mm -hmm. and also think it's at this point talking about feedback. I think that getting feedback from people outside of academia when it comes to your transitions is really important because sometimes they were like, "I don't know how, I don't understand how these ideas are yeah. connected at all. I don't. The segue doesn't make any sense." Um, because th there you have to be more. This is all about how you connect the different parts in um, your writing as a narrative. Mm -hmm. So it's not about technical terms. It's not about your discipline. This is more about stitching ideas together so it's easy to understand where you're yeah, going. And then you have to use other tricks. It's basic communication. And one easy way that you mm -hmm. can think about it is... Think about any owner's manual or instruction manual telling you how you're supposed to put something together. 
think IKEA furniture, for example, and how many people, you know, <laughs> and the people at IKEA think, okay, we've got these pictograms and it's so easy. We show you exactly what goes where. And how many people end up putting their IKEA furniture together wrong the first time? And so part of that also... They screwing yeah, it up. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I will admit, sometimes those pictures are not as easy to follow as the author probably intended them to be. But also, sometimes yeah. Yeah. the problem is that you didn't start at page one. You didn't... You know where they separate all of the bits that are there? The screws from the nubbins, from the knobs and the, the bits and bobs. How many people actually go and mm -hmm. sort those and count them to make sure that they have the right number and see the difference between the different types of screws? Because that's usually where the problem ends up is people grab the wrong piece and put it in the wrong place because they weren't really following the outline. The instruction, some of them yeah. are, are quite similar. So, so some so, of this stuff I mean, also... You need to distinguish them on beforehand. Yeah, so some of this <laughs> stuff also comes from maybe just not being as well prepared as you thought you were. Uh, but definitely, mm -hmm. we also face these issues of what you think is so abundantly clear to you is probably not so abundantly clear to anybody else. And it's, it's really a skill that you learn to become a better communicator, how you can talk more clearly, how you can write more clearly. These are things you have to practice based off of the feedback that you get from people. So you could think about this with public speaking. If anyone has ever held a speech or taught a course you need to be able to respond to the reaction of the people that you're talking to. Um, comedians do this all the time. You know, they figure out what jokes don't work. They try them in smaller audiences around other like small groups of people. And the ones that flop get cut. We don't need them. It didn't work. Get rid of that. Um, mm, or just re or rework or it rework or something. It. Yeah, yeah. So this is a big part of it too, is that ability to be self-reflective and figure out what is it that I'm trying to say and how is it that I'm trying to say it and find new ways to do it. And I think that that kind of moves us nicely into the ideas of clarity. We can, again, this is not necessarily about technical writing, but more the presentation and the communication of writing. So if we move from mm. a second draft with our focus being on improving our structure, our flow and our cohesion, a lot of that stuff is going to help with the clarity of our ideas. But now we're going to look at clarity from the standpoint of, am I making every sentence in every paragraph clear and easily understood? So we get to a point where we're, we're getting more focused on individual words and constructions of sentences inside of paragraphs. But the nice thing is, there's a lot of really great tools that you can use to figure this stuff out for you. And I, um, before we go into the digital tools, I think that... At this stage, it's more important than ever to talk to people outside of your field. Um, because one thing is talking to other students or your colleagues, and then they can kind of be, they're so in the discourse of, you know, using these different um, uh, technical terms, and they're always thinking about, you know, th these kind of issues anyway. So kind of explaining it to someone outside of their field is difficult for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Some people have are pretty good at it, but it uh, it definitely needs practice. And I think here you could think about it like, um, in a way, it's almost like a circular relationship between feedback from people within the field and people outside the field. And it's kind of all about being able to, um, you want a paragraph to be easy to understand, but still have the important information. Mm -hmm. So you can't simplify too much. So it's always this kind of like a um, talk to the expert, but then talk to someone who's not an expert. Can they understand it? And then after you have altered the explanation, then go back to the expert. Does it still say what I wanted to say? You could also look in, dive into the literature and uh, and how the you know the author of some of the ideas that you go, that you have decided to use how they uh, write about this. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's always been that when you get to these higher stages of revision, where we get into a very strong focus on clarity and concision and precision, it's not about changing the meaning of what we want to say. It's just changing how we present the word order, more or less. So we don't want to be eliminating 
necessary words, necessary concepts, necessary technical terms. We don't want to be eliminating necessary examples or evidence. But what we can do is start to look at smaller aspects of writing based off of what we call the writing principles at the NMBU Writing Center. And that's where I think to come into clarity is quite nice that we have some specific things that we can look for in our paragraph construction aside from the SEEC structure. But we can be looking for things like prepositional phrases, uh, our use of vague mm -hmm. pronouns, and our interruptions. Um, of course, there's many more. And things. also active. Yeah, active, active, speech. active versus passive. Um, you know, use of verb tenses, weak verbs, all of these sorts of things. So, if you see our YouTube channel, it's a rather simplified structure for the presentation of the revision roadmap. There's a lot of stuff you can actually do in the clarity, concision, and precision stage that it's not all very well defined in the revision roadmap because the roadmap is really more of getting you to think about how you can compartmentalize your writing. And then there's specific practices mm -hmm. and techniques that you can do in each of those stages. So I would say, yeah, aside from you can talking... You can find videos yes. about it on our YouTube channel and also inside our edit or on our yeah. SWR 100, love, the, the Canvas uh, resource We portal. love plugging that one, don't we? <laughs> but it's a great portal. Like we've, We have to yeah, do it. We've put a lot of time and effort in there to explain yeah. these things because obviously a podcast is tough to talk about technical aspects of writing. Um, but I think a really good starting point as you're moving into like third and fourth drafts with focus on improving the clarity and the concision and precision, there's at least three digital tools that you can use that we haven't created. The first one I would say to look at your clarity would be use something called the Gunning Fog Index. And basically, mm. if you go to gunning-fog-index.com, and it'll be in the show notes, you can copy and paste text into a dialog box. And what it will end up doing is calculating your use of more or less uh, multi-syllable words. So if we all remember syllables as you know, how many claps or finger snaps can you put in a word? Syllable. That's a three-syllable word. It will calculate the number of multi-syllable words, total number of words, and the total number of punctuation marks. And it'll highlight these things for you and give you a score. And the score, mm. basically, you could think of as how many years of formal education would somebody need to read and understand what you have written. And you kind of want to use it to just find where you're comfortable because you will have a voice, you will have a style, but the Gunning Fog Index is really good to show you if you have like wide variance in your style by a wide range of numbers that appear. But what's also great is it or t just tendencies yes. in your writing. But what it also does is it will help to identify things like your interruptions and very complex language. Um, so what's good about it is when you run it through, it highlights the major punctuation points. And if you notice that you have a lot of commas appearing, it's probably that you have a lot of interruptions inside of your paragraph and inside of your sentences. So you got to start asking yourself, are these interruptions necessary? Are they relevant? Can I move them? Can I delete them? Or can you split it into a, you know, maybe it deserves its own paragraph. Totally. That might also be an or, option. Or its own um, sentence. What I also like about, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, most definitely. What I also like about the Gunning Fog Index is that, I mean, we've been trying it out um, and we've been taking stuff from, it could be an article, um, it could be like one paragraph uh, from an article that we have found on nature.com. Or it could just be, you know, something from uh, uh, some kind of academic writing, you know. And it turns out that these different authors, they also have their style and they also have like tendencies in their writing and also some problems. And it's really interesting to see how these professional writers also struggle with different mm -hmm. things that can be exposed through the Gunning Fog Index. And so what is another good way of using the Gunning Fog Index, because it highlights multi-syllable words, those tend to be the words that can be more difficult for a reader to understand. And it highlights them in blue. So you can go through and ask yourself, are these quite common words that people will understand even though they're multiple syllables or are these fairly specialized or sort of abstract words 
that might not be so common that people really understand the meaning of them. And that's where you can go to the next tool. And every good writer should have a thesaurus with them. And thesaurus.com is one of my favorite places to go. It's bookmarked on all of my computers, my home PC and my work computer. Because what you can do is you can take these multiple syllable words from the Gunning Fog Index, put them into thesaurus.com and see if you can find a simpler, more common word that can be used to replace that. And that can help to improve the clarity by you're not simplifying the idea. You're not simplifying the meaning. You're just choosing clearer words to describe the same thing. Mm -hmm. More common yes. words in, in most cases. I also think that uh, I know a lot of people use Grammarly. Yes. And that also has a lot of functions that are similar to that, where, it, you know, you could change out words. You could, uh, it will help you with clarity, concision, precision, all these different things. And there's a free version, I think, and there's also this premium mm -hmm. version. But I think the free version is, is, is good Does enough. Does it look at things like uh, active and passive voice? And weak verbs? Yes, okay. it does. I, I've never actually used Grammarly, yep. but I've heard a lot of people talk about it, so I'm unfortunately not an expert on that one. And especially for people who's not a native speaker. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think Grammarly would be good if I was writing in the region as well, but uh, like a Norwegian version of it. But it can it can help. It's um, I know a lot of the international students, they, they use it mm -hmm. at uh, NMBU. Yeah, and I've heard nothing but good things about it from many people. Uh, of course, I've heard of um, a bunch of grammar blogs like Grammar Girl and some university library blogs really go into a lot of these more technical aspects of constructing sentences with active and passive voice and appropriate um, verb tenses and things like that. So the, the Internet's full of these resources if you're willing to go and learn. But another one that's really easy for you that's going to help you identify where you can improve aspects of clarity and concision and precision is most definitely the writer's diet test. And that will also be mm -hmm. linked in the description. I have made a video of how you can use this as a reader to understand why certain texts might be difficult for you to understand. And that's available on our YouTube channel. And the plan is to construct one that shows how you can use it as a writer to improve things like your clarity, your concision and precision. Because what it ends up looking for is you can put in uh, I think up to a thousand words and it will look for weak verbs. It will look for nouns in the form of nominalization. It will look for prepositions. It will look for adjectives and adverbs. And it will also look for abstract pronouns, words like it, this, that, there. And these are all things that are inside of the revision roadmap visual if you go and look at it. And it highlights all of them. And that's a really great point because what I like to use it for is identifying what is sort of the common problem that is emerging across all sections of my paper. And that's a really good starting point for me to start revising. And then what's been good for me is I've learned mm -hmm. I write with a lot of nominalizations and prepositional phrases. And that really reduces clarity and it really reduces concision because it takes longer to say what it is I mean to say because I'm filling it up with... Um, lots of words like of, by, to, for, uh, in a single sentence. I think that's um, when we talked about the Gunning Fog Index, I was just talking about me and you experimenting with it. And I, I was actually talking about writer's diet, just to clarify that for the listeners. We've been you know, putting in snippets of, of different articles and all different kinds of things into writer's diet to see um, how people write. Mm -hmm. I mean... The words they use get highlighted in different colors and get categorized. And then you can see kind of tendencies within uh, a, a person's writing style. Yeah. And it's and it's really good to use on your, on your yes. own writing, I think, but also other people's writing. And it's uh, quite interactive. So you can click on things and get more information. Um, and basically what it does is it's not going to tell you if there's any grammatical mistakes, but it looks at sort of these principles of writing. When you have a lot of prepositions, when you have excessive nominalization, uh, when you have many abstract pronouns, a lot of these tend to reduce clarity and your concision. And it just highlights many of these. So you can start thinking, is there a way that I could construct this sentence in this paragraph to be a little bit shorter and a little bit clearer 
and to get rid of some of the unnecessary words in here. And so for me, I always find that when you get to the clarity and the concision and precision stage of revision, this is where we're really working on reducing the word count. And having techniques and tools that help you to do this is really great because you could look at a sentence and think, do I need five prepositions in this sentence? And the writer's diet test will find all of that for you. But you also have to take the results from the test uh, with a grain yes. of salt because sometimes it will, you know, it will show something that, you know, it might be portrayed as a problem in your writing, but it's because you have to use a lot of technical yes. terms or something. You have to explain something. You have to, you know, uh, list up lots of different flowers or something. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. But um, so you need to take that in considerate into consideration when using the writer's diet test. Yeah. And so for me, the main things that I like to focus on is my weak verbs, my prepositions, and then my pronouns first, because those you could probably clear away quite easily. Your nouns are going to be much more important because it's the concepts, it's the topics, it's the subject matter you're really dealing with. And your adjectives and your adverbs describe those concepts, those objects um, in more detail. So they might be a bit more difficult to get rid of. We do have some really good resources in SWR 100 on nominalization and prepositional phrases. And I'll be working to try mm -hmm. to get more videos out that go into detail on these sorts of things um, as time permits to show you sort of quick ways that you can revise your writing, just focusing on things like your prepositions and nominalizations uh, to reduce your word count, to improve your clarity and your concision and precision. What I also um, really like to do when we're at kind of the concision precision stage, right? And um, once again, it's all about this circular relationship between feedback from people within the field, the experts, and people outside the field to kind of get this as clear as, as possible and, and still containing the necessary information. Um, and you could also look at words that are used in literature that, you, that you're really into or journals that are um, very good. That could be a good idea, mm -hmm. but it. This is all about. I mean, you you really need to take the uh, the audience into consideration. I mean, who are you writing for? That will decide um, to a certain extent how precise you need to be, or how concise you need to be, or what clarity means within. Uh, I mean, who you're writing mm -hmm. for. And there's a lot of sort of conventions that happen. I guess you could say just normal expected formats uh, or styles or voices, depending on the subject matter and the journal. Um, anybody who's really into things like post-structuralism, for example, you'll find these quite obtuse uh, <laughs> forms of writing full of nominalization and prepositional phrases and passive voice. And if you struggle with that, it's probably because that's just part of how they choose to present their theoretical discipline. Um, when I'm mm. going and reading over, you know, restoration ecology documents, things are really clear. Uh, things are really short. The sentences are, are well constructed and to the point because what they really want to express to you is the results of an experiment and not maybe a deeper analysis of something or a, a new creation of a concept or the invention of a new phrase or term that is supposed to be so loaded that it takes an entire thesis to unpack it to explain yeah. it <laughs> so so be yeah. aware of these yeah. sorts of it's things a, it's too. philosophical implications are so the, the philosophical imp implications are so massive yes. you know uh but 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 i do agree and I've also seen this within different disciplines that deals with uh, math to a different extent. Like there are certain things that you just, you don't need to explain it. You kind of need to um, expect that whoever is reading this has, uh, you know, the, 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 math the mathematical knowledge needed to understand what you're talking about, the, the, like the basics. Yeah. And this is where you could use these tools like the Gunning Fog Index and the Writer's Diet Test on some of the things that you're reading, because that can also act as something of a benchmark. And I'm not saying you need to compare yourself mm. to other people, but do you feel like the writing you're producing is, it, if you want to write in the voice and the style 
of certain authors that you find very influential and very easy for you to read, you can do a comparison using the Gunning Fog Index and the Writer's Diet Test to try to figure out, so what is it that makes their writing so clear and understandable to me, and am I emulating those things in my own writing very well? And again, having these tests in front of you and running your own writing through it is part of this sort of self-reflection. It's a really good technique for you because as you become more aware of the things in your writing that you would rather remove and you're going to revise for anyways, these are things that you can start changing in your practice of writing a first draft. You can catch yourself making these errors um, and you can sort of revise in the process of writing your first draft. Or you can do what I do, which is sort of accept that these are going to be there, and they'll be the first thing that you start revising for when you begin working on a second draft. So the choice is really yours. I also think that comparing yourself to other people is very beneficial, and especially within academia, because what you really want to do is you want to create something that is useful for other people. Um, and then, I mean... If this is all just like your personal kind of creative pursuit, then, you know, then you don't need to compare it to anyone else. Mm -hmm. But if you want to create something of a certain quality that is useful to other people, then comparing uh, is important. And it's the same thing with sports. I mean, when I climb, I, I try to, to get better and I try to climb stuff uh, which has a higher and higher and higher grade of difficulty. And, and that is indirectly comparing you to other people. Mm -hmm. I mean, someone did that climb at some point and, and proposed that difficulty, that grade. Yes. And you try to do it and it's difficult for you. So you're always comparing yourself to someone else's abilities. And I also think that is important within writing, especially within mm -hmm. academia. And it's not to think that you're in competition with these people. It's really a self-reflective and sort of self-beneficial approach that these comparisons are good for you to improve your own self-development, to become the type of writer. People make you better. Yeah, to become the type of writer, mm -hmm. the, the type of communicator that you want to be. And my approach to it when I'm running workshops, and I I'm apologize if you've heard me say this in uh, any of the previous episodes, but I think it's really important. As a communicator in science and as an academic communicator, you really have the choice to sound intelligent or to be clearly understood. And I can't make that decision for you. I've really chosen that to be clearly understood is way more important for me. I'd rather have people understand my ideas the first time that it's explained than to sound really intelligent, but people then end up being a bit confused about what I say um, or debate things and you suddenly come to realize, oh, we're talking about the same thing. There's really no debate here. There was just a huge misunderstanding. I, yeah. th I, th I think that's right. And I, I, I kind of have the same experience. And I, I think that if you really try to sound extremely intelligent, you will end up not really having conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you try to explain something as clear as possible, then you will have these interesting conversations and you will, you know, make a lot of different analogies and uh, you can connect at different mm -hmm. levels, not just, uh, you know let's say some kind of it could be like political ecology but that could sort of uh, end up suddenly you talk about skateboarding mm -hmm. i mean because it was some kind of interesting analogy that connects yeah. these two if different it seems things. like it works but that won't happen if you try to sound very intelligent no and this is something i think that we should be aware of when we're looking for feedback from colleagues and from supervisors as well is that there are a lot of people out there who really strive to sound intelligent, but they're very difficult to understand when you talk to them. They take a long time to get to the point. By the time they're done talking, you're really not sure what you're supposed to extract. Things are very diffuse uh, and abstract and difficult to grab onto. So if you find that maybe you're having problems getting uh, useful feedback, whether it be in written form or uh, from people that you're talking to. Also, just kind of keep in mind, is this maybe their communication style? Do they stop to think that they're not actually well understood? And the choice really needs to come down to you. 
is there a way that you can improve your communication with these people, which is what the revision roadmap is really designed to do to help you get more focused feedback? Um, and if you don't seem like you're able to get that clear communication and support on something that you're really struggling with, or if you have difficulty understanding what someone is saying back to you, that might not be the most productive arrangement. Uh, so you might want to go and look other places. And this can be very difficult if this, say, is your supervisor or a co-author. Um, but not being scared to go and find someone else who can provide you with clearer feedback that is more appropriate to the immediate needs that you have. I think that <clears throat> it's also really important to remember that most of the students, they won't be a professor within the field, mm -hmm. you know? Some people will, most people will not. So they have to use their knowledge in a different context. And sometimes that will require some mental gymnastics. Uh, and sometimes if you're good at simplifying your ideas, if you're good at making analogies, if you're good at kind of seeing connections between the stuff that you know and what other people know between different things, then that might be a really useful skill uh, when you get a job. Mm -hmm which might not be within your field. I mean, we talked about this many different times. I've had lots of different jobs. And I mean, I'm, I'm not like educated, a professional writer at all. But I kind of use stuff that I know from other thing, from other fields uh, as the basis, as kind of like my, 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 my fundament for understanding writing. Mm -hmm. And how you communicate your ideas to other people as well mm -hmm. and sometimes i feel that's um that is like a great benefit that working with you you're very often able to go and give an example of something completely different here's a metaphor or here's an analogy or here's a simile and it, it the idea just suddenly makes a lot more sense because you've said it in a way that draws those connections but in an example that is something relatable to me and this can also be a, a major problem that you might face with some of the readings that you're doing, with some of the feedback that you might be getting from people who are trained and have had long professional careers in academia. Uh, they might be a little bit disconnected from that and they might have the mindset, well, it's your responsibility as the student to come to this level to understand what I am going to say. And again, that's a personal choice, and many people do benefit from trying to think in those different ways. It really kind of comes down to you and your process and what you need as a learner and what you need to be productive and what you need as someone who is also a worker. And this goes back to what we've talked about before, which is, you know, the, the idea of multiple intelligences. So knowing your learning strengths and knowing your communication strengths and finding people who complement those maybe more so than exist in a different node of learning and expression. Um, so really, at the end of the day, a lot of this feedback, you've got to be the judge of that for yourself. Take into consideration your own style, your own approach and your own needs uh, and think about some of the things that we've been talking about and some of the resources we've been sharing and find the things that seem to work well for you and the rest of it is just practice 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 reflect even though it's about finding it your own path I, I would still advise people to go for the pedagogical route in a way where you try to explain things in a clear manner and you try to use different analogies because you have to remember, I, I mean, you've been saying this many different times, and I think we talked about it maybe in the last podcast, or maybe it was podcast number two, I'm not sure, but um, the professors, they're not trained educators mm -hmm. in any way. So maybe you shouldn't model the way you talk or the way you write after them. Some of them are very good. Some of them are not mm -hmm. that good, like people within any other profession. Yeah. And this, again, just comes down to what is your preference? As I say, you can try to sound smart or you can try to be clearly understood. And uh, there's, it's not like there is um, a duality there, that there's nothing in between. But 
really try to consider mm. what is your style, what do you like? Because some people prefer the very abstract, philosophical, uh, difficult to disentangle and understand that you need to commit days and days of time to break things down. And, uh, there's nothing wrong with that if that is how you like to work and if that's how you like to communicate. But just be aware then that and your audience is going to be much smaller and much more specialized. And therefore, a lot of the revision needs that you're going to get will probably come from a smaller group of people. But if you choose to be more clearly understood, it opens up a lot of things for you. It opens up more avenues for productive feedback. It opens up more opportunities to think differently about your research because you're exposing yourself to a wider range of people. And you can find your way in and, between I mean, those things. And just think about, you could, you definitely can, and there's value in, in both of the different approaches, I think. But at the same time, um, a lot of people are interested in physics, but most people don't understand physics. And we've been yeah. talking about this before. I mean, you see these uh, these theoretical physicists, and some of them, like Neil deGrasse mm -hmm. Tyson, and th th there's, a, there's a bunch of them, but some of them are really good at simplifying very very difficult ideas let it could be about quantum physics it could be about you know uh, thermodynamics it could be about a lot of different things but they're good at simplifying these ideas and illustrating them using you know different visual kind of examples and and i think that that draws a lot of people in you know many people that don't really have the the necessary mathematical knowledge to understand quantum physics like most people don't have that specialized knowledge. They could still kind of partake in something that is very fascinating mm -hmm. and interesting because of because these people have this ability to really explain things uh, in a way that is accessible to most exactly. people. Exactly. And so when you're thinking about how clear and how concise and how precise you can be, a lot of this really goes all the way back to things that were established in your outline. Who is your audience? What is your intention? And... I, again, I definitely agree with you, Nicholas. I'm much more on the side of if you can get the idea across simply and be understood, that is much, much better. Um, mostly because of the way that education has changed and how much information is available to us and how you sort of have to cut through the noise um, to be taken up and to be read and to be understood. But I think that that's maybe a discussion for, for another time. Oh, definitely, because it's a... You know, it's it's a big topic, but but it could still be really hard to grasp, and that mm -hmm. is important to sort of that something can be um, explained very clearly, but it's still very difficult to understand yeah. because it's just so out of the way that you normally think. And that could be, you know, it could be in post structuralism, it could be in quantum physics, it doesn't really matter. But I think that what's good about the simple uh, the simplicity approach is that even if it's incredibly complex. If you get someone interested, if you get somebody curious about it, they'll probably want to learn more. They'll probably want to read more. Mm -hmm. And then they can make the choice if they want to struggle with the, the complex and difficult to understand writers or if they want to gravitate more towards the things that make more sense to them. And so again, maybe this is sometimes one of the hidden purposes of what is it that we're trying to do through revising and improving our, our communication and for me, that is a big part of it. You know, I want people to get excited and to get curious about the things that I am talking about. I want them to try to understand it and see its implications or ramifications or the effects and how it might affect them. Um, so, and, and how they can put some of these ideas, particularly from, say, this podcast, into their own practice and get curious about how they can get better at a skill. For me, those things are really important, mm. but I, I mean, I don't know, maybe for some writers, those are, are not important things. Maybe they're just, they're just writing to write because they get paid to do it. Who knows? Who, who knows? But I think that we should move to the last stage, to proofreading and formatting. And it's probably the, the stage that it's, uh, it's not too much to say about it, I no. guess. But I think that I've always used my... Uh, my grandmother, she she used to proofread my mm -hmm. <laughs> term papers and, and stuff like that when I was a student. Uh, like a family member? Yeah. I don't know who... 
you done something I have. similar? Um, usually friends or roommates, uh, and of course, working at the writing center, I've been very fortunate that um, I'll have friends that it's sort of uh, the writing center does not provide a proofreading service, but as friends for each other, we would do that in our off time uh, with some of the previous writing yeah, advisors. Yeah. Um, I've definitely had people pay me to do proofreading as a native English speaker to do the grammar and punctuation um, and things like that. But there's a obviously you have spell checking in your word processing unit. And one trick that I found really good is run the same document through multiple word processors. So run it through Word and see what Word does. Run it through Microsoft Word Online and see what it does. Run it through Google Docs and, then, and see what it does. Because they'll their algorithms like are all a little- And open Office and then Grammarly. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and Grammarly and stuff like that. The, the algorithms are all a and little different. And Open Office is also, mm -hmm. okay. Mm, yeah. Oh yeah, I think th that's a good advice. That's a very good advice. And I, th I know that a lot of people use Grammarly and, and there's a reason that the Writing Center doesn't really offer proofreading because it takes a lot of time. And uh, there are softwares that kind of does that a lot better than most people, mm -hmm. anyways. So, and then, and what about the the the, the formatting? Yeah. Part? So the formatting really, this is why it's the last thing that you should do because it's just a matter of following instructions. If it's a course assignment, you will be given the font size, you will be given the formatting, you will be given the word count. If it is an article to be published. Uh, they give extensive information on how they want an article to be formatted um, from the typeface to mm. the indentation to your word count to the citation and referencing style, uh, how everything should be indented and spaced out, how your visuals need to be presented. So it's boring stuff and it's not really worth doing until you have something that is worth publishing or worth submitting so save it because if you're trying to do your proofreading while you're still working on much larger aspects of revising for say structure or clarity you're just kind of wasting your time you're going to get bogged down on microscopic tasks instead of the bigger more pertinent things and i've read plenty of published books Definitely. published articles uh novels um, even dictionaries that have spelling mistakes. And guess what? Most people, we're willing oh, yeah. to let yeah, that yeah. go. We, there's very few people in the world who take to arms that there is a spelling mistake in an official document. It happens. But what more oh, people... Yeah. It happens. Yeah, what more people will get pissed off at, though, is if they can't understand or if the order is illogical or if the evidence and examples they're giving don't actually support the argument that they're trying to make. Those are things that people are going to be way more critical of. I think that when it comes to formatting and especially for, you know, NMU students or, or any other university for that sake, it's like when you wanna um, turn in your master thesis or whatever, it's all about just following the recipe and think about it like, not like making food, not like cooking, but like baking a cake because then you have to be really mm -hmm. precise. I don't know too much about baking, but I know one thing and that is that it always just ends up uh, as a disaster because I'm I'm not precise mm -hmm. enough. <laughs> it's so chemistry. I'm good at cooking, or at least yeah, okay. it's, it's chemistry. Uh -huh. any, uh -huh. any baker is just a, a chemist, an edible chemist. So you need to be precise oh, yeah, there. Yeah. Um, but it's it's the same thing with with cooking. But it's you can be a little bit more specific. But you know, follow the recipe if you're gonna make I don't know a cake. Follow it to be super precise and then it will turn out nicely and it's the same thing with formatting just follow yeah. the recipe and there's lots of support if you're a student submitting for a course um, the professors tend to be rather lenient in my experience as long as you have the most basic things done and things are cited and referenced properly um, if you are a master's student for example it's a little bit more complicated but the librarians are there to help you out. Your study advisors are there to help you out. You, you know, you have heads of department who can help you out. There are templates and things to follow. And of course, if you're a PhD and, and or a researcher, you have the formatting guidelines of the journals that you are submitting to, and they're very precise. Very precise. And, and another thing is that if there's something within, you know, Microsoft Word or something that you're not really sure how to do, then you will always find really good tutorials on, yes, on YouTube exactly. 
for all these different things yeah, that can help you with the yeah. formatting if uh, the guidelines from the university isn't specific And the enough. NMBU librarians can be quite a good help. Uh, IT as well. Remember, there are services, there are mm. people who are technical experts in these sorts of things. It's their job to do them. And you can always go and ask, you can always book an appointment, uh, or these people will direct you to resources that they already have. Very often, uh, tutorial videos in how to do things. And I've used many of those tutorial videos myself, and they're pretty easy and straightforward to follow. And if you have further questions, these people are available to, to assist you. And I also think that all these different stages, I mean, from creating an outline to formatting, from general to specific, the writing advisors can assist yeah. you on all these different things. And uh, I think that there's one thing that is really important to know, and that is that it's going to be all right.